obviously we have to give enormous credit to Finale and Sibelius for being around for all this time and, and for still being useful to so many musicians. But I, I do hope that Doriku was offering something slightly different and something slightly better. I had such a great time connecting with today's guest. What an interesting person. What a cool path he's had through the music world and what a cool project he is involved with at present. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations and we're talking today with Daniel Spreadbury, who is the senior product manager at Dorico, which is Steinberg's advanced music notation software. And I discovered this, I will be brief in this intro because we talk about this in the episode, but I discovered this through my friend Garrett Hope's podcast, The Portfolio Composer. Garrett and I have spent time together in person. He's been on my podcast several years back. And he was mentioning this product, Dorico. And I thought, Dorico, what is that? Well, it turns out it is a new music notation software. And I got totally hooked by this piece of software. I found myself uh, doing more, arranging, actually writing some pieces, which I never do, and creating exercises. It is such a beautifully designed product. So Daniel and I get into certainly Dorico, but also his path through the music world, working at Sibelius for many years, and just the challenges of legacy software, something like Sibelius or Finale or other products in different artistic fields like Photoshop and that kind of thing. The beauty of being able to create something from the ground up, what Dorico does, all the good stuff. And I want to do a quick shout out to our sponsors, Ear Trumpet Labs, Practisma, Modacity, and and Dorico, and I did not reach out to Daniel for them to become a sponsor, though I I love the product, so they are on board with the podcast. So thank you to Dorico. More on them later in this episode, and let's get going with this very cool, in my opinion, interview with Daniel Spreadbury. <laughs> Live music I've heard is there's a man walking around our neighborhood wearing a mask playing an accordion. Generally, what a, what a wonderful world, <laughs> which is so perfectly San Francisco, <laughs> also <laughs> and <laughs> apocalyptic. So, <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I'm actually tomorrow night, I'm going to go and do some singing with a singing group for the first time since March in person in a church where I sometimes sing. And of course, it's going to be very, very different. There's only going to be six of us. There's a choir of normally 20 or so. But obviously, we can't have more than six people in one place. We're all going to have fixed places where we stand in the choir stalls. We have to be um, taken into the building by the director of music. We can't move around. We can't go to the toilet. We have to wear a mask um, even when we're singing. We can't touch anybody else's music. We have to take disinfectant wipes to disinfect where we've been sitting when we leave. And this is, you know, but this is the only way we can get any kind of music going without putting loads of people at risk. And it's, you know, I run a choir myself, a a chamber choir. There's just no way we can meet. You know, most of my singers are older than me. You know, they're sort of in their, a couple in their 40s, but mostly they're academics in Cambridge because I drive up to Cambridge to do that. And a lot of them are in their 60s or 70s. Some of them work at Addenbrooke's Hospital, which is the main research and teaching hospital in Cambridge. So there's just no way that we can do it. So it's a real, you know, the musical life of the country. I mean, you think I'm in two choirs and run one, all of them are stopped, you know, and you multiply that by thousands of ensembles. And then, of course, there's no theatre. You know, there's almost they did the proms, but there were like eight concerts and they had 20 people dotted out on the stage of the Royal Albert Hall. You know, it's it's just yeah, it's it's a mess. Culturally, this is a wasteland. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 incredible. It's a, yeah, I I had a the last musical thing I did before the pandemic broke out was a bass quartet here in San Francisco, and they had already shut down the schools, but they hadn't told us all. They hadn't put the stay at home in place, so we we played to nobody and filmed it and put it up on YouTube. And I had a very bleak conversation with those three other people in the quartet about all. Th- Three of whom are now thinking, I guess I have to give up music. And, they, and they're saying, how's it going, Jason? And I'm like, I, I feel bad because I, I, I was like, you know, uh, uh, not too bad, actually, because I've I'd been inadvertently preparing for a pandemic for years, broadening it. You know, so I'm not subbing in the San Francisco Symphony because there is no San Francisco Symphony at the moment. So that's a bummer. But um, th- uh, other things have been taking off. And I, I imagine it's similar for Dorico and for Steinberg as every, you know, people who are maybe stuck in their ways all of a sudden realize, oh, I need to edu- educate myself about <laughs> what's out there. Yeah, we certainly, I mean, it, it was always going to go one of two ways, basically, because we 
we're lucky that our customers, you know, they don't tend to be the guy, and this is no disparagement to the people who do this for a living, but they don't tend to be the guys and girls who are, you know, working in the service industry or stacking shelves in the supermarket. So we, you know, it was either going to be that people would go home and they would have some money because they were still keeping their jobs, but they were otherwise sheltering in place and they could afford to spend some money on their hobby, or it was going to be total devastation. And luckily for us and for others in the music business, it's actually been quite good. You know, our sales are actually up on the year, which is insane when you think about it when you hear that we're in the deepest depression in literally three centuries and yet you know music in a weird kind of a way music technology and musical instruments and so on they're selling well because people want like you say to educate themselves to better themselves to invest in themselves and their hobbies because what else have they got to spend money on they, we can't go on holiday we can't you know go to the theater we can't go to the cinema we can't you know do go out and eat in restaurants and, and all the rest of it so yeah we're going to stay at home we're going to pick on the guitar we're going to learn how to make a song in our bedroom whatever it is and and so far that's worked out okay for us yeah well dorico's almost felt like a form of therapy for me i gotta say i sit down and and, because i'm like oh i don't want to go outside i don't want to go you know and and so i sit down but what can i do i can create something and i let if you don't mind let me take you on my journey from what i was using to dorico because it's probably interesting just to know how people you know find find that and so i i used to teach high school orchestra i mean i've done a lot of things in my life um i i first started on like finesse Finale 1991 or whatever that that first version was and then my parents bought it for me on whatever you know clunky thing and did a little range and composing used used that for a few years off and on through college uh and just sort of stuck with it and always sort of hated it but also I felt like I didn't know what I was doing on it I'd always have to open it up and remember how to do tuplets and that sort of thing you know I'm like performer first messy creative kind of person and go through bursts and so and then I taught I taught high school in, in various places and they were using finale and so I kept on getting these academic licenses of finale started doing more arranging vaguely hating the product or thinking I'm just it's just me and and so then I I had been until four months ago maybe using finale 2011 and just battle battling this piece of garbage sorry finale but uh, I don't have to be uh, unbiased with what I do I'll just say what I think um and and I finally upgraded to to the latest MacBook, and that was like the end for that. You know, they were it was yeah, whatever that, that anymore. Yeah, whatever that yeah. emulation ro- mode, which is hilarious because it was all pixelated and it felt like it was 2011 again. And, and so then I thought, <laughs> and Finale right. already felt like it was 1991 oh, anyway. <laughs> that piece of software, I just don't understand. Anyway, so I, I I'd been meaning, and even one of the schools that I taught at briefly, they were a Sibelius uh, uh, department, but it was one of those phases when I wasn't arranging, and so I um. So I finally said, okay, well, let's, let's, and I, and along the way I'd used, uh, I'd used note flight for a job I had and I thought, ah, it feels freemium and limited and I don't want to be in my browser. And I, I like having to, uh, used even more recently notion on the iPad for when I'm at the pub or whatever. And I just want to sketch an idea out. That's been fun. Um, and, uh, muse score a, a little bit here and there, although I, I couldn't stand the interface of, of that. And it just felt like audacity. I mean, so cool that people could have access like that. Of course, uh, yeah. Uh, so then I about five months ago or so I say, all right, I'm going to get into Sibelius. So I download whatever that version, that the, the most limited free version. And I think yep. this doesn't actually feel that much better. It feels a little better. I, I was like, okay, there's a, it's a little better. And, and then I, I was talking to Brandino uh, who played for the black eyed peas and all these people. And he was singing the praises of Dorico. And about the same time I was just listening to Garrett Hope's podcast. Who's a friend of mine. We spent some time together in person and I kept hearing these ads for Dorico. Dorico, and I wasn't even sure what it was, but but then I and then I was like, oh, Dorico, oh wait, Steinberg, oh, I use Cubasis, and so I download it, and I love it. It's like exactly, right. it's yeah, well, it's a very my, my long journey, but it's it's this sort of feeling I had when I first discovered Ableton Live, where it's like, oh, this works with my creative flow, and just the the user interface and getting, get, I just feel like it it so elegantly transports you through the process of the creative mind and so, so i just want to congratulate you on on that and the, it's, i don't even know where to start
art. But um, the the and everybody should go pick up Dorico. There's a free version that I think gives you the bulk of the features, but two voices and then an elements or essentials kind of, and then the the whole enchilada, which I got because that's what I do when I find something I love. But just thank you for what you do because I think it's I think it's incredible. Oh, well, I'm delighted to hear that after your rather tortured journey to get that, I mean, <laughs> of course, you know, back when you got Finale 2011 or even Finale 3.7, or was when you started, you know, of course, we were, it was, uh, it was just a twinkle in our eye, really, at that point, as, as you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're lucky that we're able to to make it a more modern app just because we started later than everybody else. So, you know, that allows us to take advantage of changes in design and technology and hopefully make an app that is fit for all the things that you want it to be without it kind of having to be bolted on, which is, I think, the, the trouble with these other, older apps. They've had to evolve so much over the years. And, of course, you know, what we were doing on our computers in the early 1990s compared to what we're doing with them in 2020 um, is, is just like, you know, you can't even really compare it. So, obviously, we have to give enormous credit to Finale and Sibelius for being around for all this time and, and for still being useful to so many musicians. But I, I do hope that Dorico is offering something slightly different and something slightly better than, than those programs for sure. Well, I was talking with my wife about just the challenge of legacy software in general. You know, I, I, I'm a creative cloud user, Adobe Creative Cloud, and, you know, I like, but every time I open up Photoshop, and again, I'm even, even more of an amateur in that than in the music arranging department, but I always am like, what am I doing? Where is this? And it's just the, the challenge I think a lot of legacy software faces, certainly Finale and, and Sibelius. Um, so it's got to be so refreshing as someone who's been involved with, you know, one of those other products for a, a long time. It's got to be what a cool experience to say, uh, let's just create something new from the ground up. I heard that Adobe Lightroom was was a part of the inspiration. Is that can, can you talk about that? Because I, I kind yeah. of can see that, but I'd, I'd love to know about that. Yeah, so um, my wife's a photographer and, and quite a lot of us in the team, of course, use, you know, Lightroom to manage our own sort of you know family photo libraries and so on it sort of became the de facto tool for all that didn't it really probably around the same time that we were starting at Steinberg and what I think we really loved about Lightroom is that it's a very very focused app you know it's really really clear what it's for um, the way that it's set into what Adobe called modules um, in terms of you know the library mode the develop mode the book mode all these sorts of things means that the um, all within one window you've got a very very focused document centric approach with all the tools that you need for the job you want to do right at that moment. And um, it just felt like a really, really good paradigm for a document centric application. Um, and obviously we, we were having to think quite hard about, you know, I think one of the things about a music notation software is that it does so many jobs to do because it's serving such a wide range of, of users, you know, whether you're a high school teacher or you're a student or you're a composer doing concert music or you're doing a jazz chart or you're doing movie music or you're doing an audio mock-up for a job or a music minus one rehearsal track for your ensemble or whatever it is the jobs to be done they cross you know this enormous horizon and so one of the biggest problems that i think any designer of an app that has to do as much as a notation program does is well how the heck do you divide that up in such a way that it's actually not going to be completely daunting for the user and you know again we don't don't mean to rag on Finale, but everything you can do in Finale is behind a tool that's in one of those palettes. And then when you choose some of the palettes, you know, you get a, another palette that comes up for that thing. Um, and, you know, it, it's just everything's there in front of you all the time. And obviously on, on one level, that's that's great because it means that, you know, there's not so much switching around. But on the other hand, the downside of that is that it's very, very daunting. And the app doesn't really lead you down a particular way of working. And I think that's what, uh, what Light, Lightroom really does say as opposed to Photoshop, where Photoshop, again, puts all those tools in front of you. And again, modern versions of Photoshop are a bit different, but, you know, generally speaking, for 30 odd years, it's been that palette of, of tools down the left-hand side, the inspectors down the right-hand side, the picture in the middle, but you can do anything from anywhere in there. Lightroom is a bit different in that, you know, you've obviously you've got your, your library view and you choose the photo you want to focus on. And then all the tools change and only the things you need to work on for what you're doing right now are there. And so that was really what was most inspirational to us when we were looking at how to, as I say, sort of square this circle of this enormous horizon breadth of functionality that we have to squeeze into the software in a way that isn't overwhelming and so you know it was it was building on that idea of, of having everything in its place and a place for everything basically and not just throwing everything 
at the screen and hoping that you'd be able to find your way through it. After several years of planning, I'm so happy that my course Beginners Classical Bass is out on Discover Double Bass. This course is made up of 66, yes, that's a lot, <laughs> video lessons which cover a wide range of topics on classical double bass starting from taking your bass out of the case which is very fun <laughs> to film and Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass and I have a great blooper reel about that and leading to different bow strokes such as staccato and portato the topics also include posture simple scales and arpeggios left hand technique bowing technique simple pieces which are fun to play practice tips and much more you can learn more through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash jason heath this episode is brought to you by ear trumpet labs they make hand-built mics out of portland oregon and they have an excellent mic for upright bass called nadine the nadine is a condenser mic with a clear natural sound and incredible feedback rejection this mic is a completely new design the head mounts in between the strings above the tailpiece with a rubber grommet and the body securely straps to the tailpiece with velcro elastic a 14-inch Megami cable connects the two parts, making it easy to place on any bass. It's durable and holds up to the demanding needs of the instrument while offering excellent sound quality. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt just for Contrabass Conversations listeners with the purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash Contrabass to claim yours and check out the Nadine. It's uh, separating things out as as you do, and maybe since uh, everybody should go download at least the 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 uh, it, uh, free version of Dorco just to check out what we're talking about. But the setup to the right to the engrave mode to the play mode to the uh, what's the remind me the print ex- mode print mode that's right okay yes that's right although you can as you say export from it as well so it's kind of a funny name but but yes it's it's for outputting as it were yeah can, can you just talk about those modes just in, p- in case people aren't aren't familiar and just b- before you do i i love that separation of the right from those other steps you know it's just so and, it, and, and again thinking about my first experiences with ableton live uh and other pieces of software that especially that it just it just seems to get get the interface out of the way for what well just like you were describing it's it's really it really uh clicks with me I'm, yeah, well, I'm really pleased to hear that. I mean, it was it was the product of a lot of a lot of kind of debate and 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 iteration as we were putting the software together. In fact, there were only four modes to begin with, and then print mode was actually the last one to be added. And we we were thinking we were going to do that as part of setup mode, and that didn't really work. Or maybe it was going to be an engrave mode, and that didn't really work. And and so it was once we knew that we wanted to have, for example, this you know dedicated print preview and so on, and all the options for whether you're going to print booklets and so on. But I'll I guess I'll come back to that too. So do I? actually answer the question that you asked which is what are the five modes for well i mean you've already said what they are the setup mode write mode engrave mode play mode and print mode and and as they are presented to you on the screen they're kind of there in a strip at the top left hand corner of the screen and they're very prominent you can whack them with your mouse or if you're using a surface you can tap them with your finger and that basically then changes the whole ui of the program so dorico basically has the music in the middle of the screen kind of like the photo in lightroom and then around the edges it's got panels that change according to the mode that you're in to focus on particular jobs and so in setup mode the jobs to be done are who's playing you know how many people you got what instruments they got what music are they playing? So how many movements are there? Is it an opera? Is it a symphony? Is it a songbook? Is it a show? Is it a set of exercises for your students or whatever? And then on the right-hand side, the third sort of concept in setup mode is how is this music going to be presented on paper or on iPads or on screens or whatever? And, you know, do I need a full score? Do I need a rehearsal score that's just, say, a choir and a piano? Do I want individual instrumental parts? And so setup mode allows you to basically do all that. And the nice thing about setup mode is it's, it's sort of the most optional of all the modes because if you start the score from a particular template like i know i'm going to write for wind quartet or i know i'm going to write for big band or film orchestra then you can go straight to write mode because all of those decisions are made for you there'll be a full score there'll be parts for everything there'll be one movement or a flow as we call it ready to go and you can just start writing in write mode you've got down the left hand side of the screen all of the basic musical things like notes accidentals articulations and on the right hand side of the screen you've got basically everything else so and the nice thing about about Dorico is that all of the notations that you can create, whether it's clefs or key signatures or time signatures or dynamics or whatever they are, they're all presented 
in musical organization. Um, so oftentimes in, in scoring programs, you kind of have to learn the concept of the program before you know how to create the thing that is musically what you're looking for. And we wanted to, wherever we could to avoid that in Dorico. So we really wanted to make it so that you would create the, um, the musical item that you wanted and it would be right there and it would make sense musically in its own in its own right you know you wouldn't have to say well you know a hairpin's a little bit like a first ending bracket or something no a first ending bracket and a hairpin they're two totally separate things they should be in different places in the user interface one of them's to do with dynamics one of them's to do with repeats you should be able to find them just by clicking on the button that looks like that thing and and there they should be so right mode is all about getting the music in you can very very quickly enter all the music you can use the mouse you can use the computer keyboard you can use the midi keyboard i think that the fastest way is really using the computer keyboard because because we have this whole sort of system of, of key commands for everything. And in particular, this, this idea of the popover, which is like a little texty box that you can type into. And there's a different popover for each type of item you want to create. And the neat thing about it is that, you know, keyboard shortcuts can be difficult to remember. You know, you can remember maybe 20, 30 of them easily enough. Command S for save, command X for cut, command V for uh, paste and so on. Um, and you might remember, you know, A for a note A and G for a note G and S for a slur and so on. But beyond that, there's like hundreds of notations that you might want to create and trying to remember what to type, you know, oh, is it command shift alt, you know, Vulcan death grip seven <laughs> for this particular notation. <laughs> but the nice thing out of popover is all you have to remember is the letter of the thing you want to create. So D for dynamics, T for tempo, M for meter, K for key signature. So you do shift and D, for example. And then you just type sort of the text version of the thing you want to create. If you want a hairpin, you type uh, you type greater than or less than because they're the things on your keyboard that look like a hairpin. Or if you want, you know, piano, crescendo, forte, you type P um, less than F, press return. And Dorico creates those notations automatically. And that works for everything. So right mode gives you this really comfortable environment for inputting and editing the music and and again i think you know perhaps we'll come back to this but crucially unlike other scoring programs it's actually really really flexible in terms of allowing you to change your mind so you can make things longer make things shorter you can insert things you can take things out you can transform things make them into tuplets of different kinds you know deal with irrational rhythms have alternative time signatures it's a, it's a very very flexible environment but that's all about the musical creation engrave mode then allows you to then do graphical adjustments to the music which dorico does a lot of on its own so like determining how far apart the stave should be all that kind of thing dorica does all of that stops things bumping into each other generally puts things hopefully roughly where an experienced human engraver would would do it so there's a lot less time spent kind of dragging things around and again in fact engrave mode is also kind of an optional mode in dorico because the idea is that you should be able to just type in your music in write mode and then print it out you know play mode gives you a whole sequence of style view you have a piano roll editor you have automation editors you can work with any vst instrument you like it's got a full audio mixer and of course as you've already said jason we're part of steinberg so steinberg also makes um, audio production software like cubase and dorico actually has the same audio engine as cubase right there in play mode so any vst plugin you want to use when you want to use vienna or you want to use spitfire or you want to use whatever it is you can use all of those directly in dorico it's got a really sophisticated system of mapping all of the playing techniques in your sample library and you can kind of do that graphically in in play mode so it's very very easy to create mock-ups and then you can make midi adjustments and so on so it's kind of like right mode but for what you hear rather than what you see and then finally print mode where you've got a big old print preview and you can go down all of the layouts that you've looked at which might be the full score and all the instrumental parts and the rehearsal score whatever it might be you can set how many copies you want you can set where they should be booklets you should set where they should be fan folded all the rest of it press the big print button go and have a cup of coffee and uh, you know the job is done or send it directly to PDF, which I find myself doing all the time. Uh, and, well, and these days, especially. Yeah, yeah especially these days. Music anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy. And and the, the elegance of, so, of everything I've run into, pretty much, but that popover uh, mode, it was one of those things that I thought, what's going on? And then immediately thought, where have you been all of my life? Because it's it's so, a, a great example for for uh, string players is just being able to enter fingerings the way you, you can. And as somebody who just, 
spent how many, God knows how many hours uh, using my Finale 2011 copy to put together materials for an online base course. And I, 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 I sure could have used that. I've been, I don't do much teaching these days, but I do have a couple private students and I've been using Dorico in my lessons and it's actually just screen share over Zoom. We zoom into the music. I've actually been inputting their music they're working on, even though right. I have the print music to be able to do this. And we go right in. I say, let's talk through fingerings. Where do you think this should be? What should this be? And I just, you know, shift F, start working. There it is. Hey, should we change this? Uh, it, it, I, I've been working on a piece with a student that has a bunch of double stops. And I thought, well, how's it going to work with this? Well, it works great. Makes t- t- set. Hey, guess what? You press T, it makes the thumb, you know, il- uh, indication. And then you have that really cool, and forgive my terminology ignorance, but you have that cool drawer at the bottom that opens up in right mode. And yeah. you can indicate shifts. I can't tell you how much of my, my especially teaching, is spent trying to show people where where things are. So that the, just the, but it's all hit, just, I mean, exactly what you said. It, all of that is is out of the way until until you need it. But it's real. It's really cool. And it's really useful as an educational tool. I've just been finding it so. And then when I'm working out with the students, I say, hey, do you want do you want to practice MP3? Well, let's just export or practice audio track. We'll export that out. Um, and the flow, uh, the the concept of flows. That's another thing that I thought. W- 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 explain this to me again. And then immediately it was like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Because how often you're trying to write something in multiple movements and you want to move it around. Um, or I do a, a whole lot of oh. I need this book of 24 exercises for a bass player, but I don't know what order they're going to be in. This is a per- rather than fighting with the program, um, it just makes it really, really elegant. So those are those are just features. I I can't tell. It's made me do projects I probably wouldn't have done because they would have been too much of a pain in the butt. Like I I like I I can sit down and one of my students is really into sports and so hockey and foot American football and all that sort of stuff. He so I thought well let's just do some bass arrangements of some of these themes. It's it's the sort of thing that I would think, ah, it's a good idea in theory, but I, it takes too long. It takes no time in Dorico. In fact, I'll even hop on MuseScore or whatever and get a like a wind ensemble version of a piece, add a couple of bass parts, five minutes, I'm done, and I've got a bass duet. And I can, you know, it, it's so just the, the elegance of this and and uh, I think is just remarkable. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's really, really great to hear. And yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a funny thing, really, that, you know, flows as a concept, as you say, it's like... Like the ability to have multiple exercises or multiple songs or whatever, you know, it's so obvious because music is very rarely just one through composed bit from right. start to end, you know, whether it's a show or a symphony or a sonata or a songbook or whatever music's in sections. That's just how it works. And, um, you know, the fact that no scoring program really has made it easy to, uh, to work with uh, sets of pieces inside the same project. And like you say, be able to change your mind about what order they're in. If you imagine trying to do that in another program, you know, you'd think it would be easy. It's like effectively cutting music from here and pasting it to there. But actually, even though, of course, you can do that simply, it's all of the other work that you have to do afterwards. Like, oh, well, hang on, now the time signature is wrong here. The bar numbers are wrong here. Yeah. I have some text here that was saying what this was called, and now that's gone. And so, yeah, really what we've tried to do with Dorico is to... Um, is to really think hard about what are the practical things that you as a musician who hasn't got all day to sit in front of your computer dragging stuff around, you know, you really want to get something done. You want to be able with 10 minutes before a lesson starts to put together a handful of sight reading exercises for your student or something like that. And that should be something that you feel like you can do. And I can't tell you how pleased I am to hear you say that Dorico is so easy for you that it actually makes you do projects that you would have thought of good ideas, but would have been too much hassle to do before. I mean, if there isn't, if there's a better endorsement for, for what we've done, I don't know what it would be. I'm so, so happy to hear that. Well, it reminds me of some other tools that I love to use. Sometimes, I, I again, I'm a big fan of user interface and finding something. I'll bring up Ableton Live again. That's something that makes me want to sit down and create music. And I, I totally, it's it's reignited my enjoyment for putting, yeah, I don't I do not do much of anything, but it's mainly just for students or just a, on a lark. I have an idea and I give it a give it a try. And it, it's, a, it's such, and I, my wife, when I first opened it up, she walked by and she's a, a, a doctor now, but she 
was trained as a harpist, she walked by and she said, that's beautiful. What are you doing there? And, and I kid you not, I was doing this bass duet. And she said, could you add a harp part to that? And I was like, yeah, yes, I can. And then, and then she said, I said, did you know that Dorico does harp pedalings? And she said, get out. Like, which, you know, and, and, and she said, well, very, very dubious. Well, how are they? So then I've, I found a, a video of whatever, re- maybe you had that for a long time. I don't remember what release that came no, in. But it was, it was new in, in Dorico 3 last, last year. Okay. And this is one of those things that no, anybody listening, except the one tenth of one percent will probably care, but I'll mention it anyway. Uh, she was like, there are all these uh, things that composers try to write for harp that actually be- are impossible to play as a harpist yeah. just by the nature, the diatonic nature of the instrument. So Dorico points that out by, I believe, uh, putting the notes in red or something like that. And, That's right. And I, I can't tell you how much that, that'll save toll on our marriage the next time we start playing some duets again. <laughs> because it's, you know, it's like, oh, that piano part, that works on harp, doesn't it? There are remarkably large, actually, maybe more than one tenth of one percent of people will care. There's a bizarre uh, tendency for bassists and harpists to pair up. And I and so I know a lot of bassists that are married to harpists. Is that because you sit near each other? In yeah, that's my something? theory. You're like flirting over that, your shoulder. That, I met my wife in music school. <laughs> we were playing Smetna Ma Vlas, the first movement. There's a giant oh, harp yeah. solo. I looked over yeah. and I said, hey, who's there? And we've been together, you know, tw- 20 years later, we're, we're still together. Um, but but so something something like that. And get, I was looking at guitar. This might be even more of interest to people. The way that you can uh, indicate tabulature that you can uh, actually. Could you maybe talk about that? Because a lot of people are going to be bass guitarists or certainly guitarists. Like how? how Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so guitar has been a big focus for us really over the last, I'd say, a year to 18 months or so. So Dorico didn't really have much in the way of guitar functionality. We, we did do classical guitar fingering, actually. I mean, you were talking about string fingering earlier on. And, um, you know, classical guitar fingering is, is fiendish because, of course, guitar music, classical guitar music is so intricate in terms of all of the textures that the, the player is playing all the time. And oftentimes, notationally, is very, very dense and, and complex music with lots and lots of, you know, voices effectively different streams of music going on all on one stave and all needing to have their fingering indicated so we'd put a lot of time into working on that but we hadn't really done anything on tablature as you say um, until last year and the thing about you know tablature of course is that you know you you really want to have you want to be able to have anyway uh, depending well for example myself I, I do I kind of can play a few chords on guitar, but I really, really can't play. So looking at tablature for me is actually quite helpful because at least it then shows you numerically what's the stretch for this chord, for that chord. You know, even if I don't want to play from it, it gives you a clue in the same way that you were talking about heart pedaling and, and showing a note in red if, for example, the, um, you know, it, it doesn't match the current pedals. Likewise, if you wrote a chord voicing in a notation stave that can't physically be played on the guitar because you've got two notes that can only happen on the same string or something like that, um, given the other voices that you've got or the other notes in the chord you've got going on, then then Dorica will show that with a purple question mark to say, hang on a second, you know, that that might not be what you really mean. And so uh, you can create guitars with any number of strings, any, or, you know, so fretted instruments really with any number of strings, any kind of tuning, and it even supports um, non-chromatic instruments. So instruments like the dulcimer, for example, that have a kind of diatonic fretboard or, or even the banjo where, where the fifth string starts at the fifth fret and so you can't finger anything lower than the fifth fret on on the lowest uh, or is it the highest string Ooh, dear show my banjo ignorance now. <laughs> one of the str- either the highest or the lowest string i can't remember now um but you know and those those kinds of subtleties again which are all totally de rigueur to people who are using those instruments every day for those of us who might want to write for an instrument like that um, and maybe don't have a pet banjo player that we can ask to or well, we're not married to one <laughs> like you're married to a harpist you know um the, the ability for the software to kind of give you a steer and to show you, oh, well, hang on, maybe that isn't quite what you mean, or you might want to think about that in a different way. And there's a lot more we can do. You know, you mentioned double stops earlier. Right now, Dorico doesn't really kind of give you a clue as to whether the double stop you've written for a violin or a cello or something is, is, a, good, is a good idea, you know. But there's no real reason why we shouldn't be able to do that in the future, because we actually already know, in order to do things like the fingering shifts, like you were talking about, where, you know, as you're moving up the fingerboard with the same finger, and you want to indicate that, obviously, Dorico, to know that it can do that, has to know what note the string is on. Uh, 
sorry, what string the note is on. Right, right. Get that the right <laughs> way around. So, um, so we therefore can calculate, roughly speaking, you know, what are the likely strings that a note could be played on? The same for harmonics. And so you could imagine in the future that you could try and write a particular double or triple stop chord and Dora could say, eh, you know, that one's going to be quite difficult. Maybe it is doable, but it's only going to be doable in a certain way. You know, these, these two notes are going to be doable, but then they're really going to have to stretch for this other pair of notes like this and you know and and the idea is that over time we would really like dorico to be able to do that you know maybe it could indicate the break on the clarinet you know these kinds of things it could tell you when you're on the lowest notes of the trombone which aren't all you know gettable unless you've got a particular extension on your slide and so on you know it could maybe help you with all of those things so that if you weren't lucky enough i mean i i did do a bit of orchestration when i was doing my undergraduate degree but because uh, i did it all by hand in those days and i'm not very bright so i would transpose the horns in the wrong direction and so um i didn't get a chance to do very much orchestration because my tutor got so upset <laughs> with the fact that i kept on <laughs> transposing the horns the wrong way he said maybe we'll stick to you uh, just doing some you know piano music or something for now <laughs> so but if i'd had if I'd had Dorico at the time, then maybe I would have actually got a bit of experience in doing orchestration in my in my studies because those purely technical things, which obviously, yes, I should get that right. Of course, any undergraduate should be able to transpose a horn the right way. But you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't end up at the point where you can't do something because of um, you know, a, a lack of technical you know some something some small technical thing that stops that gets in your way basically and of course you know the the goal is that i would hate for example to have been doing an arrangement and let's say i'd actually shock horror i'd turned up at a rehearsal with my horn part transposed the wrong way rather than just taking it to my tutor who was who was going to grade my orchestration i mean how terrible would that be and that's the wonderful thing of a tool like you know like any of the notation programs they would all help you from making those kinds of errors but wouldn't it be great if they could help you not make more kinds of errors that really rely on detailed technical knowledge of the instrument, which, you know, we're the best in the world. We can't all, even if we've got the orchestration books on our shelves, we can't always know every, what's what's easy, what's doable, what's difficult on every single instrument in, in the orchestra. And I see that that's a role where we can build on the things we're doing already with with harmonics, with fingerings, uh, with, you know, with heart pedaling, with, with the tablature stuff. And maybe we can continue to build that out for further instruments in the future. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, and I know it's uh, strange that you're listening to Daniel from Dorico talk about the product on this episode. I did not get in touch with them to uh, have them sponsor the podcast, but I am a true fan, and I, uh, it, it just sort of came about. So I, I'm so thankful to have them on board. I use this piece of software every single day, and it has totally changed the way I feel about notating music, whether it's arranging or composing, which I rarely do, but I've been doing more since I've been getting into Dorico or creating exercises for my students. It's one of those pieces of software that makes me want to use it. And it's the best kind of software, in my opinion, as you're hearing in this episode. So thank you, thank you to Dorico for sponsoring the podcast. If you go to dorico.com, it'll redirect you to Steinberg's page on the software. And like Daniel and I are talking about on this episode, you can get a version for free that'll let you do pretty much anything that that the software provides with two instruments and then there are so many more options there. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Dorico, for sponsoring the podcast. My practicing companion, Modacity, this awesome app, it is so great for getting you to really think about your practicing. And there's what's called a deliberate practice mode. It tracks everything that you are improving upon and time spent in every piece is just so great. Here is founder and CEO of Modacity, Mark Gelfo, on what the app does. I use the deliberate practice feature in Modacity a ton. So what I'm logging my improvements. Oh, I improved my articulation today by using this strategy. And, and then I see that in my log. So I see all the improvements that I made, the strategy that led to that improvement. I see the star rating as well as the time spent. It is so satisfying to be able to look back on your history like Mark's describing. I do that all the time. And it keeps me inspired and energized and feeling like I'm really making progress. Learn more at modacity.co. And if you visit our site, we've got a special offer for lifetime access for this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. 
Yeah, that's 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 such a valuable point. Like those those very you know more basic things that other notation programs will show you. But what we were just talking about that that's like the the next level of education. I've been for the last three or four years. I've been I've been uh, doing some consulting on and off with a composer that works for video game music and always trying to make the bass parts a little bit more interesting. I mean, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we did an hour session where he just said, "Can you just play all of these harmonics everywhere?" And he's taking no. And and that's the sort of it. I'm happy happy to do that. But how, how great to I mean to have a program that w- continues to build up those sort of things. And it was interesting. This this uh, composer, I I we were chatting, and I said, Hey, by the way, what are your thoughts on Dorico? Because I know he'd been sending me Sibelius. Well, he'd been sending me PDFs, but he'd been talking about Sibelius. And I and and this might lead to a, a, to- a topic that I certainly would be interested in hearing about, like like getting people off of what they use and discovering something new like me with my stinking copy of finale 2011 by academic <laughs> license from a job i haven't had for years um but i just like oh, i can't be bothered and so as a result i made you know preparing this dub- double bass course or a couple of double bass courses i was filming in leads i probably had like 75 individual finale files scattered all over my hard drive instead of i could have had one one file that's a double bass technique you know series with all my flows in there but it's got to be so tough so anyway uh, going, getting back to what I was talking about, the video game composer, I said, wh- what's what's the word on the street with Dorico? He said, well, you know, everybody, f- fina- or not Finale, Sibelius is kind of what what people are using, but, but a lot of people are really close to just sort of flipping the switch. Because he said, look, I've been using Dorico since the beginning. I love it. It's it's great. Um, there was one thing, and I'm sure it's either coming out, he said he's always trying to make his music as sight readable as possible because these people are coming in for the first time. And he said, there's some some font he likes. I'm sure you've heard this before, and it may already be in 3.5. That that that. that but um, and one thing, and this is going back to what you're talking about in grave mode. There's I have not had to do anything in great in grave mode because the elegance is just of of how it's laid out is so great, and how you can move notes around so easily. Uh, there's so many things we can talk about here. I, uh, but um, <laughs> but um. The, the, I've got a couple of things last week. I, I know. Sorry, music, sorry about that. In grave so, mode. <laughs> but, but, he, but he said he said he said look. Yeah, he said, look there. So maybe and we could start with there. Sorry, too much coffee this morning. But he was um, he was saying that it's just everything's trending in that direction because people people know it, people love it. But then there was that challenge of, well, I'm used to this mildly crappy user interface, but I know how to get around it. I just don't have time in my busy life. Um, I would challenge Absolutely. people on that because I think, you know, the skill acquisition cost is well worth it in, in my experience. So but can you just talk about that challenge? Absolutely. I mean, of course, the, the, the truth is that we have, you know, tens of thousands of Dorica users now, and nearly all of them have come from one of the other programs. They've typically come from either Sibelius or Finale. And um, so, you know, the one thing I would say to anybody who's on the fence about it is, well, you know, you can do it because tens of thousands of other musicians have come before you and they, they have done it successfully. And it's very rare. I mean, it's not it's not completely unheard of, but it's very, very rare that we that we have somebody trying Dorico who's coming from one of those programs and who then, you know, yes, they may well struggle a little bit with the learning curve. And I think that the, the height of that learning curve, as you perceive it, is directly proportional to the amount of time you've been using the uh, whatever program you were on before and how comfortable you are with it. You know, if you're if you're an occasional finale user who has to look up how to do a tuple each time you come into the program, maybe like you did, Jason, then you know Dorico probably doesn't present that much of a of a challenge because hopefully it makes sense on its own terms, and you're not kind of totally in the mindset of I know exactly how to do everything I want to do in my current program, um, as you might be if you're using finale or Sibelius all day every day. But if you are coming from from those programs and you have been using them a long time, you know, yeah, it's it's different. They think the all three programs think differently from each other but there's definitely more in common in the way that finale and Sibelius think about music than the way dorico does and also you know dorico just from being it is very keyboard focused you know you can do things with the mouse in dorico but like you know inputting music with the mouse in dorico for example you can't drag the notes up and down after you've put them in and we've done that to try and make it difficult for you to make mistakes one of the things that happened all the time in Sibelius and I used Sibelius for many years I worked in Sibelius for many years is that you know everything is live in Sibelius all the time so you can be arrowing through the notes and accidentally change the pitch of them because you accidentally press the up arrow key or the down arrow key 
and you know or you can accidentally change an accidental very very easily <laughs> that's a pun but i didn't mean to make a pun you can accidentally change an accidental um but you know those, those kinds of errors can can slip in when you're working in a hurry and and what we really wanted was to make sure that dorico is much more deliberate you know so you you really can't change the music by accident in dorico and that is annoying to people who come from other programs they you know in sibelius there's no mode like in grave mode if you want to drag the stave around you can just click the stave and drag it we don't do that in dorico and mostly that's because you don't have to drag the staves in dorico so you know in a way and i've said this before you know that i think that if there was one thing that i would have changed about sibelius while i was while i was still working there it was that the fact that you can drag the staves around so easily because nobody ever really figured out the right way to do stave spacing in Dorico. Everybody just did it by hand because, uh, sorry, in Sibelius, everybody just did it by hand because that was the way that the program showed you to do it. You could click on it, you could drag it. Well, that must be the right way to do it. But in fact, it wasn't. The right way was to was to use the settings in the engraving rules dialog to figure out what the distances should be and then use optimized staff spacing, you know, to actually fix anything that wasn't quite right. So what we tried to do with Dorico is not put the things that we, you know, or rather, Put the things that we want you to do up front, make the things that we don't want you to do or that you don't need to do often, make them all there in their own place where you can find them, but not make it super easy to do them when you don't need to. So, you know, for that reason, a Dorico user will never discover in the first hour of using the software how to drag the staves around, whereas it might be something they do literally with their second click in Sibelius if they click on the stave and then drag it. You know, and, and in that way, it is a little bit more like Finale than it is like Sibelius, because, because in Finale, you also can't drag the staves around unless you go into the page layout tool, and then, then you get a handle for the stave and you can drag it. And so in some ways, Dorico's approach is kind of like a hybrid of the two in that we have note input and default appearance that is very straightforward, very easy to use. I think easier than, than Finale, certainly, at least as easy as Sibelius. The music looks better by default than in either program. And then to get at those kind of things that you don't need to do so often, they're sort of behind other tools. They're either in another mode or they're in, you have to press a tool button on the side of the window to activate it. And that's a bit more like Finale, where you kind of have to prepare for the job that you're going to do rather than just stumbling into that job like you can in Sibelius and you know obviously that phil that's just a philosophical difference really more than anything is being right or wrong but as I say the way that we that we've approached it is that we we want you to learn the things in Dorico in right mode basically go to right mode put the music in hopefully it looks pretty great already then you can go into engrave mode if you need to, and you can start making changes. And so I think it's it's really about the mindset, because if you've been using Finale for 20 years, or if you've been using Sibelius for 20 years, you come to Dorico and you're going to think, I'm going to have to drag this around, I'm going to have to do this, I'm going to have to do that, I'm going to have to do the other thing, because that's what you've been used to in the program that you've been using. And so in a way, part of it, the biggest part of it, is persuading somebody they can trust the system. You know, the other thing is that, you might not trust Finale or Sibelius because, you know, oh, well, if I do this, then I get a problem with my multi-bar rest. And I had that rehearsal last week where, you know, the flute player had this weird rest that had the wrong number of beats in it. And, and so I really have to check that every time I put in the flute part that I'm going to have to, you know. And so you develop your own sort of superstitions and rituals about how to work around. And of course, that'll be true with Dorico to an extent as well. Of course, it will. No, no software is free of its own quirks. But the idea really, as I say, is that, if you if you learn Dorico in the way that it presents itself to you, then hopefully you learn to trust it. And then there is actually less for you to learn than there was for you to learn in Finale or Sylvanius because it does so much more of the job for you. But it's really, really hard to take yourself out of that mindset, all that knowledge that's been so tough for you to acquire and so and so, you know, valuable now that you have it, to then just say, huh. I don't need any of that anymore. It's, it's a huge ask to somebody. Yeah. Well, it might, in, in a way, and probably a lot of folks are, have a similar background to me, kind of like occasional arrangers. And I, I imagine yeah, we, we have a different experience than someone who's writing full time, you know, for motion pictures or video games or, or, or symphonic performances back when we had those <laughs> six months ago, yeah. eight months ago. Um, <laughs> but but and another thing that, that uh, struck me, uh, a, a question mark in my head, but then I really 
realize the how cool it was is the on meter nature of what you get when you open up right mode and, and how cool this is so I'll try to describe my experience I thought like where's the four four where's the three four and I but then oh I'm starting to enter some notes starting to enter some eighth notes you know just sort of goofing around and then I think oh yeah this could be in two but what if it's in three and 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 again that taps so eloquently into the creative mindset in my opinion and so you're not thinking oh now I have to like figure out this tie and so Dorico every note has I'll, I'll try to describe it and you can uh, get, uh, correct my my amateur description like every note has a given length and it doesn't matter what the meter is Dorico will adjust in terms of how it lays out the music accordingly am I kind of getting that right you're exactly right so if you think about it you know our, our experience of music as people is is how long the note sounds for yeah. not how it's written on the page you know and like the only people who ever care about how the music notes written on the page are the people actually playing it everybody else who's experiencing the music doesn't give a hoot whether it's notated as an eighth note tied to an eighth note or a quarter note or whatever nobody cares about that that's just for us who are trying to make the music alive you know by playing it that's what we need to know and so Dorico is kind of all about how the music sounds and that's how it thinks about music so when you in in um in Dorico when you put in a note like you say you think you're you know you press the button on your keyboard that says quarter note well it doesn't say quarter note on the keyboard of course you press the number that corresponds to the button on the screen that says quarter note it'd be cool if keyboards did have quarter yeah. note buttons on them but sadly <laughs> right. they don't um so you press six which is the the duration for quarter note and then you type it into the score or you play the notes your midi keyboard and as you say exactly as you said depending on where in the meter you are so let's say you're one eighth into a bar of four 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 then dorico won't actually draw that as a quarter note it'll put it in as an eighth note tied to an eighth note because in order for the player to read that bar clearly and know that they're going to play the right rhythm it should be notated as a as a t under most circumstances anyway it should be notated as two two eighth notes tied together but the really freeing thing about that in dorico is that you don't have to worry about it again in finale and sibelius when you're typing in music you've got to be super super careful about the rhythms because um it doesn't do anything for you and you know some people might like that and there is a mode in dorico where you can say no don't do anything to the rhythms just take all the notes exactly as i specified them but but generally speaking like you say when you want to do something creative and you're not yet sure exactly how this melody is going to go how this rhythm is going to go is it going to be in five or seven or whatever it might be the fact that you can type in a note and dorico will draw it the way that it thinks it needs to be drawn right now for its position in the bar according to the current meter that you're in but then you change the meter or you insert the, some music before it or whatever it is move it around all of which are really easy to do in dorico in a way that really isn't the case in other scoring programs it's very easy in cubase or ableton or whatever because you can just grab music in the arrange window and you can just whiz it left and right and you can whiz it up and down and so on um, but scoring programs really don't work like that but dorico is trying to be enough of an open environment for you as a composer or arranger that it is that free and you can just take a note and you can make it longer or you can jump it over here and it will renotate it each time so that it still makes sense in terms of the meter so that if at that very moment you press alt right to move it by a thing you know and now it's in a different position and even if you did nothing else apart from just print it out you're still not going to have a question you know a hand going up in the rehearsal room from uh do you really mean this because it's still notated clearly and it, again it's all about saving you time and, and allowing you to trust the system that the system knows musically what you want and how to present that to your players uh, and in fact somebody said to me the other day something which i i hadn't really kind of thought about so in such a in such a way but it's like one way that you can think about this is that um it's a way that somebody who maybe is obviously very musical but maybe doesn't have a lot of skills in terms of how notation works in all of its minute details and of course in the past somebody who might have then trusted finale or sibelius to do this and they don't of course they might assume that it does but the fact that dorico actually does means that you could be somebody who say is working primarily you know doing things with virtual instruments in your sequencer or whatever it might be you could actually bring that music into dorico and then have some confidence that a real human player could play it the way that you intended it because it's actually transformed the music for you into a way that would make sense to a to a human reader rather than just whatever midi needs to make the right sounds come out of whatever sample library you're using and that's quite a powerful thing um, because it, it basically gives you an extra an extra bit of assistive assistive support from the software in terms of having confidence that you can just think about how the music should sound and let Dorico really worry about how the music should look. 
Yeah, it's I, I, had, a, I had a great experience uh, along these lines a couple of weeks ago when I was doing one of these inputting one of these pieces one of my students is working on, and I took I decided I'm going to make the part look exactly like is is what I, what's on her page, and I did that and I could do it, and then I started entering more information, fingerings, and then I finally said, you know what, let me just let Dorico do what it wants, and it looks so much better. It's like oh, this piece really should be on a page and a half, and everything was spaced better, and so I just you know so it's it's in it's. it's it's uh, and kind of along the lines of what we were talking about with heart pedalings and the like, you know, being able to uh, have the program automatically adjust the notes like that. It's uh, it's uh, it makes things a little less scary for people who maybe don't don't live in that world. It's it's really cool. I hope so. And and again, it is also something we thought a lot about in terms of I mean, you were saying the fact that it's open meter when you when you open up. That was something that came directly from seeing. Um, children using Sibelius in schools, which I spent a lot of time watching kids using Sibelius. And again, this is no criticism of uh, either of Sibelius or of music teaching, but so often I saw the case that a teacher would stand at the front of the class and say, right, open up Sibelius and then write something, you know, whether it was for a string quartet or whatever. And because Sibelius would open up whatever template you'd started with, with, you know, four bars of four four or something wouldn't say four four but there would be four bars and they would actually be four four even though the time signature wasn't there and so many students just start filling that in you know depending on how on their experience level if they're obviously a bit more experienced they might already have an idea and they might start to feel the meter in the head but for beginning students you know and and here in the uk we're in the lucky situation where you know if you're at secondary school you're age you know you're uh, 11 or upwards (coughs) there's a decent chance that you'll actually encounter music notation software in your music lesson it's just in your general music lesson and so you might you might not read notation at all or you might read it a little bit because you played recorder in primary school or you're learning violin or something but you are just going to you know depending on your experience level as i say you might just feel like well the program is telling me what i've got to write i've got to fill in the gaps between these bar lines basically and so much music written by students as a consequence in these early students you know it's basically taking those decisions out of the students hands and you know, in a funny kind of way, Dorico sometimes gets criticized for doing so much automatically. But the things that it does automatically are the things that you shouldn't have to do yourself. And the things that it leaves to you are the decisions that you should be able to make as the person writing the music. And so that was, as I say, directly from watching, you know, students age 13, 14, using Dor- uh, using Sibelius, sorry, in their music lessons. And, you know, those decisions basically they're still possible for the for the student to take of course they can just press t and they can change the time signature but so few of them knew that they should do that and so um we really wanted to to make it clear that when you start a piece of music in dorico it's really like starting from a blank piece of paper no matter how true that really is in Sibelius and Finale because of course you can change all those things sometimes at a cost you know if you've written some music in Finale and then you change the time signature you can have a lot of ties and all sorts of other stuff to clean up which you won't have in Dorico but it's just that that kind of hopefully inviting I mean some people might say oh it's a bit daunting there's literally nothing there but one quarter rest I've got to decide everything but yes, you do. You're the creative person. You do have to decide everything. That's kind of what you're there for, hopefully, is to decide everything. Yeah. And who, when they're just walking along, singing a melody to themselves, decides this melody is now in 4-4? Four, four, you know, like, like uh, I'm going to now sing a melody. It's, it's, it will be in 4-4. Four, four. And I, I'm now thinking back with chagrin to all these assignments I would give some of my high school students back when I was doing that, uh, with, you know, must be in 4-4, four, four, must do, must, you know, be in G major. And, and you know, you've got you've created kind of the equivalent of just uh a kid walking by the piano and just playing a few notes it's really it's beautiful i never really thought about how that how uh, that uh would affect education that's cool there are so many great uses for the class anyone who's classroom teaching at the very least download the the free version which is it it basically has everything i mean there are just a few features it doesn't have if i I remember correctly that's right so so dorico se which is the free one that you can just you can just go to dorico.com and you can just grab it and download it today basically the things that it missing it doesn't have engraved mode Mm -hmm. so you can't do any graphical dragging but as we've been talking about hopefully what you find is that things look pretty good in dorico without you needing to drag things around anyway and the music is laid out and you can still do certain formatting things like deciding where the system breaks you go you know which bars should be on which systems and so on um so it doesn't have engraved mode and it only allows you to write for two in two players actually you can write for more than two instruments because you can have players 
who double or play more than one instrument. But so you could write, you know, very easily you could write for voice and piano or harp and bass or whatever it is you want to write for inside Dorico SE um, completely for free forever. And I think, you know, again, there are lots of free notation programs out there. You've already mentioned several of them today, like Note Flight and MuseScore. And I think, I think those programs are great and it's so wonderful they exist. And Note Flight you can use on any device from anywhere. You know, you don't need a powerful computer to use it. You just need a, a browser and MuseScore is free. I mean, and, and it's, you can, you know, so much more music has been created in the last decade as a result of MuseScore being available. But none of those programs really give you what Dorico gives you. And what Dorico gives you is this environment for composing and arranging where the computer is actively helping you and making better musical decisions. It's leaving, as, I, as I've tried to sort of get across, the important musical decisions to you and then taking care of all of the tedious work of presenting that music clearly taking care of all of that automatically and the other programs wonderful as they as they are they just don't work that way and again dorico se also allows you to use virtual instruments so if you want to get in and do midi editing and so on again neither note flight nor MuseScore, they don't have features like that the free sibelius doesn't have anything like that so really the idea behind dorico se is that we wanted to give people you know a taster obviously of, of big dorico and hopefully people will then feel like they want to upgrade to dorico elements which is only something like 70 bucks more than than dorico se or even maybe one day move up to dorico pro like, like you have jason but you know it should be useful in its own right. And if you're a instrumental teacher, like, you know, doing bass lessons or doing trumpet lessons or doing singing lessons, you can absolutely do your work in Dorico SE and it's completely free and it'll be free forever. And, um, you know, and of course, another really nice thing about Dorico SE is that it can actually open files made in big Dorico as well. So if, um, if I write a file for, you know, double choir and piano or something and i send it to you who's only got dorico se you can still open it and play it back and print it out so you can even use it as a rehearsal aid so you could actually write a you know you could you could be working with your quartet or your string quintet or your string orchestra you could then write your arrangement in dorico and all of your players could have dorico se and they could open that file and they can play back their part and they can look at just their part or they can hear the whole arrangement and they can slow it down and all the rest of it and they can print it out they can't change it but they can they still get all of the benefit of having something where you can highlight that music and hear just that bit or slow it down or whatever it is so we hope that it's a it's a genuinely useful tool you know obviously it is for to some extent it's a shop window for for dorico as a product but we really hope that you know we really wanted it to be something that for example young people who are thinking about getting into composing or arranging we hope they would stumble upon that on google you know, and again, they'll probably see MuseScore first, but I hope they'll give Dorico SE a try because it's really intended to be a supportive environment for learning, for improving. And, you know, even when you know what you're doing, hopefully, you know, our philosophy is if we can do something automatically that you would have done anyway, we should just do it because that way it's saving you time. And, and you can get that experience, whether it's Dorico Pro, Dorico Lens or Dorico SE. And, and, you know, it's been it's been successful we've had you know again tens of thousands of people have downloaded dorico se and are using it um but we want more people to be using it because you know there, there's so many people out there who who maybe have the need of just occasionally jotting out a few notes for a you know like you say for a lesson or for a rehearsal or just because they have an idea in their head and we would really love people to to be able to use dorico se to help get those ideas onto paper or pdf or ipads or whatever it would be yeah. Yeah. Well, and to piggyback on that, and I, I, I resonate so strong with everything you were just saying, you know, think about folks who are listening, think about when a student first gets to play a nice instrument, that look in their eyes or those simple pleasures. You ask professionals, uh, what's your favorite thing about playing in the San Francisco Symphony? And, and people say the sound of my bass, the sound of my viola and, and Dorico, uh, it, it's something I want to use. Like I've said throughout, it, it makes me excited to work on music. If I was classroom teaching right now, I would be, well, I'd, I'd be sitting at home uh, doing Zoom, <laughs> do, trying to figure out my life. But let's rewind a year or go forward a year or two. Um, I would be putting that up on the projector, just like I was talking about with my students. I would be highlighting notes. I would be putting in fingerings. I'd be using it as an educational tool. I'd be playing back. I, I am doing that in my private lessons. Uh, you can, I did the I did the month-long trial, which at least a few months ago you're offering, and, and did the Big Dorico, and then I got to the the end of the month i 
said, well, this is obviously what I, what I need to be using. And, and, but how cool that even if I decided just to, just to use SE, um, I, anything I could have created, I could open up. So students can easily work on anything that you're creating. And a lot of people out there listening, I know you do a lot of bass duos or technique things, so you can, you can do it all on there. So I, I, I dig it. I, I, I'm so thrilled you take some time to chat with me. I was, I was, I was just finding myself late at night watching uh, ever watching Dorico tutorials till midnight or one in the morning. I thought, okay, <laughs> let me reach out to Daniel. So anything else you want to get out there to the podcast? Obviously I'll link up, link up to Dorico and, and um, everything we've talked about, but yeah, thanks Jason. I mean, I, I would actually just on the subject of tutorial videos, since you just mentioned it, my, my colleague, Anthony, who is the voice of Dorico, as it were, he's uh, he's got a great, great voice for, he should be a voiceover artist. I think he's, uh, he's got a wonderful fruity and mellifluous voice that is actually quite pleasurable to listen to. He's put so much time and effort into now producing. I mean, it's certainly over a hundred very focused tutorial videos. You know, if you're, if you're worried about learning a piece of software like Doric, you think, well, gosh, it sounds rather complicated, uh, you know, cause it is a sophisticated application, no question about it, whether you're coming at it as a new user or whether you're coming at it from another scoring program. Um, but our YouTube channel is a really amazing resource because Anthony has, as I say, produced these very, very focused, but very, very clear and concise videos that show you how to do a particular job. We also have my colleague, John, who's our product specialist. He does a monthly live stream. So if you actually have a, a question like, oh, I'm not sure how this project should go. Like if I was going to do this thing for drum set or this thing for jazz band or something, you can email John and he might well choose to actually then work through your issue in a live stream uh, with, you know, 100 other people watching and what have you. And that's really valuable. Plus, we've also designed that, you know, because of course, these days, we all learn everything via Google, you know, none of us go to, you know, read a book, sadly, anymore. I quite like reading books, but I've got a few on my desk here that I'm working on working my way through. But none of them is about software, because you can't really get printed books about software anymore. So knowing that, um, and the fact that we don't have a printed manual for Dorico, we've designed the, the Dorico help to be totally Googleable. So if you want to know how do I enter dynamics in Dorico or how do I add base fingering in Dorico, you can literally just Google that and almost certainly answers one and two will be a tutorial video that shows you how the fingering feature works. And the second link will be a page from the Dorico manual that goes step by step through how to create fingering. And, and so we've worked very hard on, on the resources around using Dorica. We've also got some great things you can download from our blog, like, you know, lists of all the keyboard shortcuts, because, you know, again, we can't remember them all, I'm sure, but it's really worth learning like the top 20 or 30 key commands that, that you're going to use every day because they they transform your facility with the software and make it feel much more like an instrument that you're playing than a piece of software you're sort of poking and prodding at. Um, and, and finally, just one last thing to say is that we have a really, really, really active forum and friendly community um, on, on the Steinberg website. You can get to it by going to dorico.com slash forum. That will redirect you to our forum. Um, and, you know, I'm on there. Other members of the Dorico team are on there day and night, basically, um, along with, you know, normally hundreds of other Dorico users who are really, really supportive community and you won't get flamed for asking what you might think of as a silly or basic question. You know, it's a really, really um, supportive environment full of musicians who are, who are, you know, using the tool with great success. And, um, you know, we, we have worked hard to kind of engender a really good community around Dorico. And, you know, we hope that people won't feel intimidated by, oh gosh, you know, this is this high-end software no it's totally totally open to all totally friendly supportive um community that you'll find when you when you start using the software and we really listen to our users too you know we really really do i, I literally must interact with on a daily basis and how we make it more and more suitable for the things that they that they want it to do um, so yeah i would really encourage people to to give it a try Daniel, you rock. What a great conversation. This was so much fun for me. Uh, hopefully that came through in the podcast. But and, and I know I get this way with products that I really love. Modacity and Mark Gelfo, my friend, who has created this super cool 
practice app that I've just I've been using for years. It actually made me practice more. That's the way I feel with Dorico and and Dorico. Uh, obviously, different. The Modacity is a, is a startup. Uh, Dorico is coming from the uh, Steinberg, which is owned by Yamaha. So so a major team behind that. But still, it's one of those pieces of software that just makes me want to use it more. Makes me want to be creative in that uh, genre or whatever. I, that's the wrong word. But thank you so much. Dorico.com will take you there. You can get to it through Steinberg's website. That Dorico.com will just redirect you there. But check out their SE version for sure. Uh, at the very least, just play around with it on your Mac or PC and and see what you think. It is there are many. This is this is a I guess it's a it's a crowded field. That's a fair way to describe it because you have obviously Finale, which I used since the early '90s. You have Sibelius, which I dabbled with for a bit before discovering Dorico. Now you have Dorico. You have Muse Score. You have Note Flight. You probably have a bunch of things I'm not even thinking of. Uh, Muse Score is free. Uh, the, but but the, the the jank factor <laughs> it, it, with music notation software is so high for me with the the my personal path which if you have listened to this point, I'm sure you're a true fan or you can't turn off your your uh, podcast listening app for some reason. But you heard my journey through all these different notation software options. And I just I the, I dig this product and and everything like i mentioned again i'm just sort of reiterating i guess here in the outro but everything i played with in the app is stuck for me like like and i don't find that to be the case with so many apps i have been an adobe creative cloud subscriber for the past year and a half or so but dang it every I, the the it doesn't stick with me when i do something in photoshop i i forget I forget, like, the, if I don't do it over and over and over again, it's not intuitive to me. It's the same thing with Premiere Pro, which is what I use to edit. It's the same with Adobe Audition, which I am staring at right now as I record this outro. If I don't use it for a little while, I forget because it feels clumsy to me. Maybe that's my dumb, sloppy, creative bass player musician brain or... <laughs> Maybe it's the interface. And Doric was one of those things, that popover mode. Oh my goodness. Shift whatever. Shift F for fingerings. That makes so much sense to me. And then I'm entering fingerings. And it works really well. And it works. Boy, I'm just like going on and on. But I love this. So I guess I'll keep going. I, I, I've been using it with lessons in this current COVID and can't teach in person, at least in my situation. Uh, the, the, so I do, I do Zoom. I do a screen share, I call up Dorico, and I say, okay, let's go through this. I zoom in the 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 bar that we're working on, and I hit Shift F, and we talk about fingerings. And I say, hey, do you want to do thumb one three? Do you want to do thumb one two? What do you think? And I use it as a teaching moment. I press P on the note, and it plays that passage. The student can hear it if I share my audio. That is so cool. It is so cool. And maybe... Sibelius is doing similar things in 2020. I haven't checked. I it didn't seem like it when I downloaded their free version. Maybe Finale is. I the last as you heard in this episode, Finale 2011 was what I was rocking. I'm sure they've made innovations since then. So maybe they're doing similar things to what Dorico. Probably not, and I would assume, but maybe. Uh, so I, I I dig it. I I know that it, everybody has their own way they like to do things, and the sunk cost thing that Daniel and I were talking about is a very real thing and I know that in my life I I resisted moving over to Adobe because I was doing other things I was doing images in a different way I was doing video in a different way I was doing audio in a different way and I just didn't want to take the time to learn something new I decided that I want to just get good at one thing that is prof a professional creative suite of apps that has been around for forever so I decided to go in with Adobe but Oh my goodness! It is not has not been as easy for me and with my brain as Dorico has been. So if you want to play around or experiment with with a, a new way of doing music notation, I dig this. Wow, this is like a five minute uh, ad for Dorico, which is now on board as a sponsor, which is very cool. But again, I said this in the intro. I I, I never in my life have reached out to a company for an interview with the intention of having to be a sponsor. Sometimes that has happened naturally, but that is not. I am I I have that has never been a motivation for me. So I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to have them on board because as you can see, I've been ranting for over five minutes about 
how much I love this, but uh, there, there's no sleazy uh, tit for tat in the background. There never has been. Uh, there, there never will be unless I suffer brain damage and become a vastly different person. So I had better wrap up this extremely long outro just <laughs> singing the praises of Dorico. And uh, I guess, yeah, this is far too long. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just wrap it up. Thank you to the team who helps me do everything on this podcast. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, Mitch Mori, and Krista Copper. Mitch makes beautiful bass in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Learn more about him at MitchMooring.com. Award-winning bases, by the way, and just an extremely cool guy. I, I love every... It, Mitch is one of those people that brightens my day every time we interact. So if you have any needs in the base world or just want to talk to an experienced Luther, I'm sure Mitch will reply. MitchMooring.com. Learn more about him. I am your long-winded and Dorico-loving host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 